science has unraveled many mysteries of the universe over the last few centuries. But there are some questions that have remained the same since the beginning of humanity. Questions like how to be happy, how to maintain focus, what is discipline, what is love? These are questions that we have always tried to answer, whether through religion, spirituality, philosophy, or through neuroscience. And perhaps the answer lies between all these different fields. And that's what I want to explore in my new series called Intersections, where I call upon guests from diverse backgrounds and explore the hard problems of life with them. And my first guest for this series is one such person who answers such questions for millions of people around the world, the founder of Art of Living, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. A few days back, I travelled to Bangalore, spent a day in his beautiful ashram there, sat with him during his satsang in front of 2,000 people and had a conversation where I asked all of these questions. And he was very gracious and I genuinely enjoyed the conversation that I had with him. Now, a disclaimer, in this series, I will be having some differences in opinion from my guests especially when it comes to healthcare, alternative medicine, evidence-based medicine, and some questions of religion and spirituality. Some of my guests may have belief systems that I don't share, which I am okay with as long as the conversation is respectful and it leaves us with something more than what we started with. I hope that you don't let any of those differences take away from our conversations and I hope that you enjoy this as much as I did. So without further ado, let's jump into the first episode of Intersections with Dr. Sid Warrior. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you, Gurudev, for giving me this opportunity. And I was not expecting to have this conversation in front of such a beautiful crowd against such a beautiful background. Thank you so much for having me here. I want to talk to you about hard problems of life. Through my course in medicine, I have understood that there are some problems that human beings go through that has always existed since the beginning because the human brain has always been like this. So some issues that today neuroscience is understanding, spirituality has always tried to solve them. So some of those things I wanted to talk to you today. And the first thing is something you already mentioned, which is attention. Human beings have always had trouble focusing for a long time. And in today's world with social media and other addictions, for the young people, it is becoming extremely difficult to focus for even 10 minutes. What is the practical way for college students, young professionals to build that attention and achieve something more? Yes. Just let us uh, examine the subject of attention. Where you will give attention? If something is thrilling, you pay attention. If something is causing anxiety, fear, you pay attention. Or if something is some, uh, if there is something that you love so much, that's your passion. When you have passion for it, you pay attention. No, you have passion for cricket. There is no attention deficiency there. <laughs> you are glued to the television and you don't even take breath, you know. You <laughs> You forget to take your breath also. You are holding your breath and you are watching and your attention is 100% there. Now, when your mind is terribly stressed or filled with too many ambitions or anxiety or unfulfilled desires, then attention deficiency happens. Now, the way to get rid of these, uh, all these issues that causes attention deficiency is focusing your breath, relaxing your body and mind, going into deep meditation. 
few minutes of meditation brings freshness to the mind and you, when you wake up or when you get out of the meditation you feel your perception is improved, you are able to see things focused and you are able to be in the present moment much more, more and more and enjoy this moment and absorb uh, this moment which otherwise you cannot do because your mind is preoccupied for planning or uh, angry about the past. Our mind is swinging between being angry about the past and anxious about the future. Meditation <coughs> helps you to come out of these extremis, extremes, extremities. Yes. The latest neuroscience studies has shown that Meditation can allow your body to shift from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic state where sympathetic is where you are always threatened by something that is attacking you and parasympathetic is when you are calm. And these are studies that have come in the last 10 years but meditation as a practice and yoga as a practice has been on going on for centuries. The other hard problems that I also feel spirituality can address is about motivation. And here I have a personal question to ask. Today, Art of Living is in more than 180 countries and uh, more than millions of people have taken the courses. And I heard that 35,000 teachers have been a part of Art of Living. But it started with you 35 40 years ago and i cannot imagine what it must take what motivation it must take to begin from there and now everything that we're seeing here has come from that how does one maintain a goal and build on top of that for so long you mean how do i maintain the goal yes <laughs> I am the goal and I am in the goal, so, <laughs> so I never said, thought, okay, <coughs> this is my goal, I have to achieve this. No, I just share what I knew, what I have. I know this will help everybody and it just keeps growing. I say our, comp I usually tell our volunteers, our teachers, our competition is cell phone. <laughs> like cell phone has reached every almost every home in every corner of the world, we must also reach happiness to everyone. <laughs> and when you know uh, what, whatever you know, when you share with what you know with others, and their life becomes happier, and that's the main motivation thing, you know that. Yeah, your work itself becomes your motivation. Hmm. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is to not have an external goal, but it should become your identity. No, I'm not saying you should not have goal. Everyone can have their goals. No hmm. problem. I don't have any goal. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's a different story. <laughs> See, there is a difference between motivation and inspiration. Okay. Inspiration happens when something is, is your very nature. Hmm. If you ask a river, what is your motivation? River never says, I, my motivation is to reach the ocean. No, I am, I am water. Nature of water is to flow. Nature of fire is to go up. Right. Like that, there are certain uh, aspects in our nature which, uh, which is inborn, right. but they continue to be. And when you are in your elements, in your nature, then you don't get exhausted, you won't get disappointed, you won't get tired. None of this happens. Right. No. There was a very interesting study that had happened uh, 10, 20 years ago on the power of hope where some rats were in a pond and just before the rats were drowning they pulled the rat out 
made the rat feel safe and the rat would earlier only struggle for 10-15 minutes but after you pull the rat out and make the rat see, feel safe and you put the rat back in now they would struggle for 3-4 to four days before giving up and the study concluded that this is the power of hope many times I wonder if religion gives that hope for people allowing them to fight for longer oh this one can look in in one's own life and look into others life you don't need rats to find out <laughs> <laughs> rats need not be the example for you to that hope definitely <laughs> gives you power it's common sense when you see when you have a hope that uh, you will you will get through an exam and that what motivates you to go through when you have no hope you think you are going to fail the exam you will not even touch the book right so it's a hope that drives you everywhere and if there is a hope that you will uh, you know you will win or you will you know succeed you will move when you don't have the hope you will not even attempt you will withdraw you get depressed right. And so, uh, it is, it's a fact, and it is part of our uh, nature. In Yoga Sutra, Patanjali Maharshi has said that Shraddha, Shraddha means faith, belief. It's more than Shraddha, faith, belief. It's more than hope. It is a quality of life, quality of mind. Hmm. Uh, which is very solid, that is called Shraddha. It's uh, like the condensed consciousness uh, with certain characteristics which would uh, help you to move forward mm -hmm. and which also opens you to uh, innovation and knowledge. There is the saying in Sanskrit, Shraddhavan Labhate Jnana. Mm. Even science is based on faith. You do an experiment and you say this rat has, this has happened, so you have faith in it. Mm. Without that faith, even science cannot know. Correct? Yes. Every science is evidence-based. And evidence, you have faith in the <coughs> evidence. And you think that if this has happened here, in five cases, it is going to happen in 50,000 50, cases. It will happen like that. That faith yeah. is the basic <coughs> ingredient of any research, any knowledge, or even movement in life. And this Shraddha includes the hope also. Is resilience an inherent part of human beings or is it a skill that can be trained and learned? Both. It's a bit of both. Hmm. Uh, some nervous systems are so trained that they are resilient by nature. For some others, you need to train them, need to train the mind. It's both. For, for example, some people are by nature very calm. They don't need to do anything. By nature, they're very calm, they're very quiet. But others who are a little jittery and restless, if you teach them some breathing, some bastrika, some pranayama, <coughs> and some meditation, they become calm. Right. They become serene. Right. So it is a bit of both. One of the one of the things that people are struggling with, especially younger people, is modern relationships. Because again, talking about hard problems, love and relationship has always existed since human society has started. But today the traditional right and wrong has become blurred. What is right, what is wrong in a relationship is changing. Uh, are there 
universal truths that apply suppose in modern relationships like polyamory where one person can be with or fall in love with multiple people people are confused about this how is this possible are there truths that we can still learn from traditional values that can apply today yeah love and relationship is very complex issue people who don't love themselves they demand more love from others when they demand love they destroy love you fall in love with someone but then then you start policing them when you are in love with somebody you want to know everything about them you become too curious and this curiosity makes you police them mm. where are you going what are you doing what did you do what you know you ask all sorts of questions and a person from in the, on the other hand who has to answer all this they get frustrated they get stifled yeah so when you get stifled naturally with this demand and stifling you know you don't uh, feel free when you lose your freedom love also disappears evaporates uh, actually you it appears as though love is there evaporated if you ask me love never goes because it's your very nature so what is needed in uh, in any love and relationship is what you don't one basic universal principle is what you don't want others to do to you you shouldn't do to others right you are in love with someone and you say i want poly relationship i will have many but the people person who you are in deep love with if they are in poly relationship would you agree right they'll say oh, no i don't want my lover or my beloved to be looking even to someone else but i say no i should have the freedom i can go with anybody right. this is double standard so when people talk about this sort of uh, you know uncommitted relationship they have usually they have double standards mm. it is relationship for convenience without commitment those relationship doesn't uh, lead one into happiness they usually get into disasters and more hard burns and finally they are left with nothing a uh, dry and high and dry high and dry so basic universal rule is what you don't want others to do to you you shouldn't do to others period i say the same thing applies in business also in business every businessman has a vendor and a customer yeah. you don't want your vendor to cheat you so you shouldn't cheat your customer right good day meditation can help you transcend how you see reality and people who have meditated for a long time see the world in a different way nowadays there are people who experience that with psychedelics and these are chemicals that change the way you see the world and some studies are showing that psychedelics can even help in treating with mental health problems experiencing depression post traumatic stress disorder psychedelics can help them come out of it is there a good and bad in this see there is nothing absolutely good and nothing absolutely bad let us speak it very clear good and bad is always relative as you see vitamin b12 is very good but too much of it is no good vitamin correct. d3 is very essential correct a little more of it becomes toxic in your body correct so if you ask me whether vitamin d is good or bad i say both yeah like that um, psychedelic as far as psychedelic drugs i have never tested them used them for your information <laughs> but because i see those people who are using it they were not so inspiring for 
<laughs> for me to even try it out. Because you look at their face, they look like a beaten up dog. Which is sick and lame and so down and you know, they don't look blissful. They make it some blissful experience momentarily. But the amount of misery they undergo and they create for people around them is appalling. Oh. One person who has gone into psychedelic drugs, look at their family life. Hmm. They're not happy. Even look at them, they become so vulnerable, so dependent hmm. and completely uh, broken down. It's a disaster. Hmm. That's why I say, even young people, stay away from drugs, say no to drugs. Hmm. Hmm. And here, meditate, you meditate, you do pranayama, you get all that blissful experience, altered state of consciousness, and it not only uplifts your spirit, it stays with you, doesn't cost you yeah. either money or your health or your relationship. Yes. So, in fact, it helps your body, it helps your mind, it helps your relationship, everything. So, this is a different type of drugs <laughs> which would simply uplift you rather than the other ones which would... Uh, Destroy your nervous system. Mm. Yes, as a therapy, someone has therapy, you take even all the drugs you give, except even opioid. In America, we are doing this um, research work is being done on our technique in, on opioids. People, they are taking painkillers, drugs, they are night and they get so addicted to it. And that becomes, um, you know, uh, the reason for their death. Yes. A large section of societies die because of medicine. Yes. Fentanyl addiction is a big problem. Very big problem. So, we need to shift them. What you are doing, Siddharth, is very good. You are bringing in some spirituality, alternative healing, you know, inspiring. As a neurologist, when you tell people you have to do breathing, meditation, yoga and all, and you know, people take it and they do it. And when they do it, they find their life so much more better. And Thank you, Gurudev. Uh, a, a close friend of mine is a big fan of techno music. And if anybody has gone for techno music, you know that taking some substances is common to enjoy that kind of music and uh, she is she has been part of art of living for a while and the last time she attended one techno event she meditated for six hours before the event and she said she's never enjoyed the music more so clearly meditation does have a role to play and uh, children who are young kids who want to experience that kind of high because they have not experienced this Psychedelic drugs seem to be a good or easy option, but I'm so glad that we spoke about this. Uh, Gurudev, this is the last question that I want to ask you, and this is something that has been bothering me as a neuroscientist and as somebody who's interested in spirituality, which is determinism or the concept of free will. Because the more you read about neuroscience, Initially, I used to be a big believer in God and then I started reading my science textbooks and I became an atheist because I thought all of this is uh, its not real. And the more neuroscience I read now, the more I feel that very few things are in our conscious control. So much of it is happening at a much deeper level. And sometimes I question what is free will then and how much are we in control of what we do? Because everything seems to be coming from an instinctive, emotional space. So, what does spirituality have to say about this? As you know, our body, the neurons remain in the body. Our brain remains in the body. It's not just the brain, but the consciousness, which is using our body as the boombox. <laughs> you see, a television tube is here. Our body is just the tube. 
But the wavelengths that is, uh, the radio waves, that is creating the images, the pictures, making it alive, mm. the electrical waves, that is different. So mm. we, we need to know that the body, the neurons, but there is something more, the consciousness, mm. which is present all over in everything in the universe. Individual consciousness and there is a universal consciousness. Mm. And the consciousness as a space, as a field of energy, is much more than the, the, the limited um, personalities or persons, what we think we are. Hmm. Is See, this... it's... Uh, um, the relay station is somewhere, it's relayed from there, and then you catch it here. In the same way, the field is everywhere, magnetic field is everywhere. And if you see the magnetic needle, if you think the needle only is the real magnetic field, you are mistaken. You have a compass. That compass shows north and south. Yeah. We are only attending to the compass. But what makes the compass show to the north and south, that field, we are forgetting. Similarly, so our neurons, our nervous system is just the compass needle. But the field is consciousness. Here, when you ask me this question, free will and destiny, it is a bit of both. Hmm. For example, I usually give a layman's example, your height is your destiny, yes. your weight is your free will. <laughs> right? So you are what? Five feet six inches? Eleven. Five feet eleven inches. So, 5 feet 11 inches, this is your destiny. You can't grow this more. But your weight, you can't say, this is my destiny, I have this much weight, right? Some days I say it, but I know it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. You, you, you know, so, life is a combination of both. Right. It rains, it is destiny. To get wet or not, is your free will. Right. Right. Yes. Yes. You feel hungry, that is destiny. That is, that is a, you said no parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous yes. system. So, sympathetic nervous system is there and parasympathetic, both are there. One you have a control to, and on the other side we don't have. Yes. So, that, that answers the question, destiny and free will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gurudev. Thank you so much. So that was my conversation with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you enjoyed listening to other perspectives on some of the topics that we usually talk about here. I hope to sit down again with him in the future. So let me know what topics you want us to talk about then. And also, who else would you like to see on these series? If you're a subscriber to my channel, thank you so much. It means a lot to me. And if you're not, consider subscribing. We talk about neuroscience, spirituality, philosophy, and have wonderful conversations with some incredible guests from around the world. I will see you all in the next video. Lots of love to all of you. Cheers.